Where you at now? Troy, where you at now? Poland. Poland. How long you've been? Are you there? Like every time you're, you've been there for a while, haven't you? Yeah. Um, I'm teaching a bunch of students out here and um, I've got some like other work that I'm doing here as well. So I've been pretty much here. I mean, not the, not the whole time, mm -hmm. but I've been here for a lot of the summer and I'm going to be here for a few weeks yet. Is that, uh, is that convenient? Cause you got your place over in Germany. Is that like you just drive over there or something? Yeah. Well, the, um, the plan is uh, I've got, I'm training some guys next week. Uh, weekend and then the plan is i'm going to go to berlin for uh for a week or so uh mm -hmm. to, to go and chill over there and then come back here because we've got another bunch of guys that we're training so yeah it's it's uh it's a lot of fun man but uh it's a fantastic place especially in the summer lots of very beautiful girls it's always good are you, you get tired of traveling all over because i some hit me like two years ago where i'm like oh man i i just don't want to hop on another plane or or drive well, across a country again I hate I hate traveling like a lot of people like most people I hate the actual traveling but I like getting to the places you know yeah. um so in Europe I try to get trains when I can cuz I hate going on planes and all of that stuff um but you can get around by train for to quite a lot of places which is cool and to be fair I mean like when I'm here it's like I I basically my routine here is very stable really i'm sitting around in my room most of the time working to be honest i'm trying to keep it very office hours you know i've had pretty pretty busy work uh work week this week and uh so it's not like a big holiday it's sort of pretty pretty much business as usual it's just i'm in a different city yeah you got a place out there then you were like do you get airbnb no no i'm just i'm i'm in a hotel at the moment um i probably should have got an apartment but this place is pretty cool it's not so expensive and it's uh there's there's a lot to you know i mean just varies from place to place, really. I think if I was going to be somewhere really long term, I'd obviously probably rent an apartment. But um, this has been pretty cool. Yeah, I remember, you know, because Fitch, we're, I, I think we're all roughly the same age. I mean, I don't know how you guys were when you were younger, but I, where I thought I'd be <clears throat> in terms of living arrangements and working. Yeah, I'm so far from that. <laughs> where you travel in here, you try to fit you. I, I don't know if you ever thought you'd be a, a fighter or something like that. But man, I, the, the I, idea of sitting down and having athlete a house. My whole life. Yeah. So like, yeah, I started working to be a professional athlete at nine years old. So like. Really? Uh, yeah. Like I knew I wanted to play pro football <clears throat> and I started playing football at, at nine years old. It was fourth grade. And then I started wrestling too, because I just like, it felt like I could fight and not get in trouble for it. Mm. And then I switched up senior year of high school. I decided that, you know, nobody was knocking on my door to play football, but I could still walk on to a, a Big Ten team or a, a D1 school and wrestle. So mm -hmm. I decided just to go with wrestling. Yeah. And then fighting just kind of it happened. I was going to be like, I was begrudgingly going to be a teacher. And then fighting popped up and I was like, hmm, this, this sounds interesting. I was hearing stories from Mark Coleman and uh, Gary Goodrich and, and Tom Erickson about their travels and exploits in Brazil and, and, uh, in Japan and run-ins with gangsters and mafia, mafia guys and strippers and all kinds of stuff. And it sounded amazing. Like, it sounded amazing. great. And yeah. Yeah. I was mafia like, that sounds a lot cooler. Than, stripper, sure. Sure. Yeah. I was like, that sounds a lot cooler than, uh, than teaching a bunch of snot nosed kids. And I don't even get to like <laughs> pick the curriculum and all that shit. So yeah. It's not satisfying thing. And if a kid's pull a knife on you, you can't punch them back. You go to jail. It's crazy. It's, it's, it's baby. That was 20 years ago when I went through my schooling. And I was like, this is just babysitting. I was like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be stuck in this position. Like all the teachers I, I was around that I, I, I observed and had the student teach with, they were all miserable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like they had their souls sucked out of them. Mm. It was sad. Yeah, I had a, a run in, if you could call it that, on the interwebs. <clears throat> Some pretty boy teacher oh we're saving the children we need more money and all that yeah, other I stuff that. and i yeah i just and i just said dude you're babysitters re <laughs> holy cow whoa yep. and it but it's true it's true i was i was just like look you're, you're paid to take care of the children that mostly american parents don't want to raise that's that's mm -hmm. the sad truth about babysitting and i am somewhat sympathetic to the teachers because the the children that are being sent there <clears throat> no discipline, no respect. It, yep. it, it's failure on, on all aspects, but then it just, it's the damn truth. Like, look, you're there. Cause mommy has to work to pay off yeah. her student loans 
and the dad and, ain't going to instill any kind of discipline. And so I'll a, say, the, I'll say that know, mommy wants to work. She, you know. she deserves to work. It has. Uh, there are plenty of places to move and live and ways to live where you don't, you don't need as much money, but people yeah. refuse to live in those ways. Or they've been conditioned not to want to live in those ways. Mm. Like I saw a thing. It was a post yesterday. They're saying that it now costs, uh, an average of three hundred thousand dollars to raise a child from birth to to eighteen, and that's about eighteen thousand dollars a year. I'm like, what the hell are these people spending money on? You know, like daycare. Oh, well, that's what they're out. They're day, spending daycare. the money on daycare. Yeah, yeah. yeah they're that's working that's like, and this was a big fight I used to have when I was married. Was she wanted to get a job, and I was like, why? Like, you know, we were struggling with money at the time, and I was like your job will only pay for the child care. I was like, right. just take care of the kids. That's your job. Like you already have a job. Mm -hmm. and it was just, it was just, it's frustrating. Very frustrating. There was a study out there and I quoted it in one of my books. Um, and I don't, don't quote me on the statistics, but a significant percentage, maybe it was a range between 30 and 50% of uh, women. If they, just stayed at home and took care of the kids. They come out as a family financially ahead because they weren't making that much money anyway. The daycare was eating the majority of the budget, and the cost, uh, the cost of traveling to the job itself. Oh yeah, yeah, and and now, now you have to have a second car. Now you have to pay for the yep. insurance. Now you have to pay for all the gas. Yep, and then time wasted in traffic. Then you throw in the various uh, financial tax advantages of of you know being lower income as a family if there's only one income and the various child tax credits and all that, and it it it's one of those issues where you everyone assumes the goal is to be financially ahead or do what's in the best interest of the family or the children, and then you realize no, that's what they want. They want to work a career no matter how pointless frivolous it, it is for ego career. satisfaction no. even if it comes at the expense of the family it's not most time it's not even a career it's just a job oh it's a hobby yeah you know, i'm sorry yeah all the teachers and social workers out you girls aren't doing anything you're not doing it's, it's not a real job it's not a real job speak of people without real jobs what's up rollo the champ is here <laughs> what's up man Nothing much. We got this thing going on. Were we expecting anyone else? Uh, I'm sure somebody will. F <laughs> if uh, if John, Modern Life John, knows that you're hosting, I have every expectation he'll show up at some point. Yeah, sober, <laughs> hungover, or drunk? Which one? Well, um, uh, with a naked chick in bed. I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> what I are they done? Not with Paul Benjamin today, so we'll see. Yeah, are they down in Florida oh, yeah, or something? In Miami. Yeah, he was in. Uh, he just did uh, Justin Waller's show uh, yesterday. He did. Uh, uh, he was on value tainment with Adam Sostick on Thursday, um, which I I was a little disappointed in that show, and not because of John, but because like every time there's a girl on that show, it's like Adam always defers to the girl, and like the you know whatever porn star happens to be on there sucks all the oxygen out of the whole room, and so it's all it's all focusing on like well it's like dissecting this woman's like psyche or something, and it's just like let's let's have a conversation instead of just sort of glad handing these chicks. <laughs> is it a like legit porn stars or just some gal they brought Sometimes in? It is actually no, oh. most of them are. Um, let's just say only fan stars. We need a new designation right now. I think. I I don't know not not to plug or anything, but she's been very fair. Um, what's her name? She's like one of the few legit gals I would talk to or have on the show. Ali. Ali. Fem Sapien. Fem Sapien. Yeah. 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 She's cool. You can yeah, have like with her. I was Excellent. on with uh and I, and I know everybody hates her, but I was on with Tori last week in uh Connecticut and uh, I was there with the Savo brothers and she came out there as well and I did a show with her and I did some other uh live stream on their show on their channels as well. And uh it, it those ended up being some really good conversations. You can see a lot of those clips on my channel right now, but I, I think a lot of people sort of like they look at her and they go, Oh, she's just a, a typical thought, but she actually can carry on a conversation too. Who's Tori? Do we know Tori? Torsha. T oh, Torsha. Oh, okay. Right. And the feminine truth as well, Rollo. 
did you do what something with the feminine truth? Uh, like oh, feminine with uh, with uh, Tallulah. Yeah, I did yes. actually do her show too. She's actually, you know, I mean, she's older, so maybe that has something to do with it. But like, she, and I'm by older, I mean like she's like 37. <laughs> so um, yeah, she's a uh, she's kind of on her game as well. Um, yeah, she. I, I think she plays well with uh, with uh, Allie as mm. you know. Um, simply because it's like there's I think there's this sort of demographic of women who want to get into the red pill space and there's the ones that are doing it because they're handled by some other dude and then there's the women who are like really have some genuine interest in it right like if you look at like Marnie wing girl she's just, <laughs> she's just the face she's just the yeah hey, I know you and I know you've had to deal with this she does nothing but buy like spots like ad spots on my channel yeah. <laughs> But it's not her. It's her boyfriend or her husband who runs that show. She's just the one mouthing the words and reading the teleprompter. And then there's like Roma Army and some of these other girls. And it's like there, there's this new push, I think, uh, very similar to what happened in the MRA movement, uh, where like Paul Elam and Dean Esme decided they wanted to have like Christina Hoff Summers and, and Cassie J and and uh, Karen Strawn and some of these other girls who uh, were are almost now synonymous with the MRA movement uh, and launched their careers, but did nothing for the MRA. Right? I mean, it was just it was just sort of their springboard to becoming the brand of me that that they are. And you know, Cappy has no idea who I'm talking about. But I know who you. I know Laura, uh, 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 Karen Strawn. And, Karen Strawn. Uh, yeah, I know. Yeah. The, I would say they're more authentic. I mean, one mm -hmm. of the the first movers. Yeah, um, they I, didn't. They don't get there any other way unless they get a a soundstage from someone like uh, from like Paul. Paul, Paul who, by the way, hates her guts now for whatever what? reason. <laughs> God, gee, man, I I don't know what it is with all the infighting and all that. But Christ, I thought we left middle school behind. How? Wh yeah. Why? Why is it? Ran. It never ends. Wait, Troy, when are you and I going to have We're a beef and hate each other? What are we going to disagree about? What are you, I'm up for it, man. I'm up for it. Let's... No, it's not getting better, Aaron. <laughs> I'm up for it, man. Let's, let's, uh, we'll sort something out behind the scenes there. Okay, we'll, all we'll right. We'll score out of beef for sure. I don't, who's I don't know. Who's the grumpiest old dude in the fucking space? Oh, Christ, I beat you in that. <laughs> <laughs> I, what, come on, that, that, come on, that's not even close. We got to come up okay. with something traumatic and, and yeah, saucy yeah. and yeah, behind the scenes. and so. mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Well, yeah. let's go. We got a quorum. I'm, I, we'll, we'll wait for the rest of the people to come in. I did want to have uh, this conversation about screwing up uh, for, for a couple reasons. The main one uh, is that if you look at success – it is not um, line. it's not making millions and uh, being the billionaire and the big moves true success especially making it accessible to your everyday man and woman is not screwing up that has been my my uh, observation not only in my own life but when i do economics it's like okay look the main the main reason people are poor they have more kids than they can afford uh, more recently, majoring in dumb stuff. I have like four rules. Don't commit crime. <clears throat> and then uh, the third is don't major in dumb stuff. But whatever. But it, it, it's screwing up that really prevents people from succeeding. And if you just avoid mistakes, you're going to have a lot more success than me saying, well, if you trade crypto or this or that, which sure, you could, it can lead you into it. But for the average person, if you can make 100 grand a year, not have debt and not mm -hmm. have a, a, a children you can't afford – Man, you're going to solve a lot more problems. And uh, because we're all old, uh, there's no doubt that we have made some screw ups. And a, a secondary kind of reason I want to do this is I don't like hero worship. Um, it's great and humbling when I've been recognized may maybe a dozen times in public. And usually it's pretty cool. But then I, it's like this, oh, my God, you're Aaron Clary. It's like, yeah, I've, I've been him for 47 years, and it, it's the most boring thing ever. I'm, I'm fascinated. You think this is this is amazing. But I, I take a shit like everyone else. And so I like to kind of take us down a notch so you realize, yeah, we're human. We've screwed up. <clears throat> and if you can learn from our mistakes, which which is the uh, the ultimate irony of wisdom, is getting young people to listen to it. Because I could tell you not to do something, but because of the allure of you don't know what it what it is, you're going to go and make these darn mistakes. So I figure between all of us old farts, we got to have some screw ups in our lives and in some general areas as well that guys could take away from it. And maybe not the obvious ones like, hey, don't don't marry a single mom who's 
siblings, whose children are all half siblings. Yeah, I think we got those. But I figure you guys must have done some screw ups in the past uh, that would be of benefit uh, to the audience. Don't become a dating coach is the first one because, because <laughs> dating coaches, dating coaches are universally the most hated people on the planet because you're hated by obviously by by the feminists and by sort of woke type people obviously hate anybody giving male dating advice. You're mm -hmm. also hated by the incels and the black pill dudes as well for supposedly you know giving false hope and you know conning guys or whatever. You're hated by who else is there? You're hated by other dating coaches who spend all their time making hate videos about you. I hate you, um, Troy. Yeah. You're hated by Aaron Clary. I mean, it's pretty much there's no end to the hate. Yeah, uh, you get uh, hated by you get hated everybody by, hates uh, me. Go by the nor <laughs> by the normies. You get hated by the normies. Anybody who thinks, exactly. oh well, no, this is the way it is. Like you're just preying on uh, weak and vulnerable men with whatever crap you're yeah. selling. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Do you guys exactly. actually regret your your choices though in career? Like you don't regret being a dating coach, do you, Troy? I mean. I know there's drawbacks to everything, but uh, would you have preferred to be a, I don't know, a sheep herder or something? <laughs> um, no, not at all, actually. No, I was being flippant. I mean, look, um, I think to for a more serious answer for me, I mean, one of the biggest mistakes I made was staying in corporate work for far too long, really, and staying mm -hmm. in unsatisfying work that I really, really didn't like and didn't suit me for far too long. I think that was that was a key mistake. And if I could have my time again, there's not many things I really regret, but I think if I had my time again, I would spend a lot less time doing that. The only mitigating, the only slight excuse that I've got is that when I started doing the corporate stuff, the internet wasn't as advanced as it is now in social media. So now it's quite straightforward to sort of go online and have a personal brand and sell things and have a website and all that kind of stuff. It was a bit more challenging back in the day, but nowadays I don't think really, I mean, you know, I'd want to be hanging around in the corporate career for, for, for any length of time, really. Let me, that'd be a great question to post to everyone here because <clears throat> we've had some kind of formal employment in uh, the formal economy, uh, which back in the day may have been viable, but it's my opinion that it really, you, coming out of college or high school, it's more of a pit stop now. And that young people today should be aiming for some form of self-employment, not out of choice. I, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but the days of being the loyal ward cleaver of 35 years, I think mm -hmm. that's kind of over and, uh, and obsolete. Would you guys kind of agree with that, that your, your main goal should be, I mean, I hated my career in banking. I mm -hmm. think modern life, not modern life, uh, 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 Ryan, he, he, he did a stint in corporate America or corporate Canada uh, and he didn't like it either. Would you guys agree that the formal employment is, is no longer tenable or it wasn't worth it? Or would you have done differently? I, it really depends on a lot of people's mindsets, but it, it seems like bureaucracy has just grown so much, whether it's government or a, a business itself. Like it's just, you have to cut through so much bull crap to get your job done. If, and you're forced to into certain behaviors and, even the even the police guys I was working with a couple of weeks ago were talking about their their ten hour um, pronoun use course they had that they were forced to take. You know, like I, I just don't think for a lot of people that like like us, I don't think you could take it. I would I could not survive in that type of environment. Like mm. Mm. I know going back is not an option. Mm -mm. Not an option. I always I think about that every day. It's like you know I'm I'm going to be doing this probably till I'm dead, <laughs> in some way, shape, or form. You know, and no, I don't have some incurable disease. I'm just saying it's like I will probably I, I don't see myself ever going back to like working for someone else. Um, one of the reasons why I I I mean I'm not one of the reasons I didn't want to do. Uh, like a contract kind of thing with value attainment was because I don't want to work for someone else. I don't want a boss, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to freaking, I don't want to be anybody's employee ever again. And, uh, the, I, it's not, it's not even so much like, Oh, I feel like I earned this. It's just like, I, I think it's like part of the process maybe like when I was in the corporate world, I mean, I came from a, a from a background of, of marketing and branding and advertising and, and, you know, graphic design and art direction. And I wore a lot of hats throughout my career, my norm, my normie career. Um, so I was either doing like videography or I was doing sound or I was doing I, I have a lot my my skill set is really 
really deep. So when I stopped working like full time anyways for um, for other people, um, and in this case, it was the wine and spirits slash uh, casino gaming marketing kind of thing. I got into the gig economy then. Right. And so then it's like I'm doing the same thing, but now I'm doing it for me freelance, right? I don't get any freaking benefits. I have no, you know, 401k or medical insurance, but I can pretty much name my price because all these guys are still dependent on me to do their shit. So then you get into the gig economy and that was really, what would you say that was like a 2014 ish, maybe 2014 to 2017, somewhere around there. And then, you know, I'm writing books on the side. I've got, you know, the first book came out in 2013 and then right around 2017, um, I went a little bit more towards the what I now call the hustle economy or the engagement economy, however you want to call it. But like what we're doing right now is what I would call the hustle economy for better or worse, which is when your side hustle becomes your main hustle, your main thing. And so being Rolla Tomasi was just something I did because it was a labor of love. And I was doing, you know, 10 some odd years on the in the forums and we went from forums to blogs to YouTube to writing books and sort of just kind of snowballed. I don't I didn't set out to be an author. I didn't set out to do what I'm doing right right now. And I don't think most of us did. No. It was just a progression. So oh. we have we have the benefit of like like you and I and well actually pretty much everybody here has the benefit of uh, having lived in a pre-internet world or a pre-social media world. And now we're thinking, oh, man, I can make this kind of money just knowing what I know because I have this background now. Sure, shit, I'm going to do that. But it is I think it's a progression. I don't think there's any college classes for being, you know, a hustler, you know, a hustler university. Right. There's no <laughs> there's no market. There's the, you're not there. Nobody's teaching this in college it, because it really it's the Wild West. We're still figuring this shit out. It probably will start. I bet you there will be college courses soon, though, where it's like how to be an influencer. Oh, I'm sure there probably are yeah. some online courses. Sure, right. Like podcasting, yeah. digital media or something like that. Yeah. How to be an OnlyFans star. And by hustler, yeah, I mean more and more people are not going to college, too, though. So, mm. yeah, well, God. and mostly guys. So. Mostly guys. So I didn't say I'm not I, I've never been a PUA. I've never been a dating coach. I've never been any of this crap that everybody thinks I'm, I'm all of it. Right. I've been through all of that and I have taken what was valuable and I added it to my skill set and I added it to who I am and what I'm about in my work. And then I threw away the stuff that I thought was just nonsense. So when people say, oh, he's a dating coach. Oh, he's married. Don't talk to him. Or he's uh, he's um. He's not, Royal Tomasi don't get no hoes, man. He's not out there in the clubs. He's not fucking girls, random girls. What's his, what's his notch count, right? So it's like, what's the criteria for success in those situations? And I think like, Aaron, like what you were saying is like, you know, what does it take to be successful? And that's been a sort of a, a point of like, I was say a goal, but it's something I've been sort of hashing out recently, like particularly like this year, I think is, there's guys who are like driving tractors in Oklahoma, like in the Midwest. When I was, when I was, a matter of fact, when I was in Tulsa for Pat Campbell's uh, memorial, I'm looking around, I'm going, are these the guys that are going to find like dudes draped over Lamborghinis relatable? Are these guys going to like find like, you know, yacht parties and all this other stuff? Is, is that what these guys are dreaming about? Or are they just kind of like saying, you know what? Success to me doesn't look like that. Or that no. doesn't. Exactly. Like fantasy. And a lot of guys are kind of, you know, like, I'll, I could never be that. Well, okay, but you could be more than you are. Mm -hmm. And so what does success look like to a guy who lives in some village by the ocean in an Argentina, right? Or, or who's the top G in, you know, some third world country? He's not going to be the top G in freaking Miami, but he's going to be the top G in, I don't know, Haiti, Right. Like, what does that well, look like? I wanted and, to I wanted to make my money fighting and move back to the Midwest and have 100 acres with, you know, woods and ATVs and my own water, my, my own lake. You know, like if I if I had the money to buy a supercar, I wouldn't I don't not, I don't like cars. I'm not a car guy. People show me pictures of the car. I'm like, that looks uncomfortable. <laughs> like it looks uncomfortable. Like I'm a big guy. Like for me to like when I have to squat down to get into this little ass car, it's not fun for me. I don't enjoy it. I mm -hmm. don't like riding low and looking up at the cars around me. Like it's not fun. I don't like it. I'm not gonna spend that money on that thing. Mm -hmm. I, if I had that money, I would buy like an MRAP, one of those military vehicles that the, the SWAT teams and stuff drive. Like if I have 
you know, three quarters of a million dollars or something to spend on a on a, a vehicle. I want one of those. Go drive it out in the mud. And, I would love to go to the Fitch compound if you ever build it. Yeah, that that like almost that be was, better than Disneyland. You know, so like when people are showing me the pictures of their um, you know, their their nice cars or their their beach house or whatever, like I, I would love to vacation and spend time in the beach house. I'd like to have money to have a beach house to go away to. But like mm-hmm. I'd rather be somewhere on my own land, have my own chickens, maybe some lambs, a big ass like tank to drive around, <laughs> bunch of guns. Like that, that's that's success. I get along with Aaron so well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I loved. I was showing people your picture, Aaron, the other day. You had you which had your one? Gun on your chest and your. Oh your yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, that people are giving me guff about that. Like, oh, you posing with a gun? It's like, no. There's mountain lions out here. Yeah, I was hiking by myself. It's around. not an option. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, I'll tell you. I'll let, tell you. Here, let me let me tell you a funny story that just happened to me in the last couple of weeks. I had a uh, Jason Hartman out to North Shore here in Lake Tahoe, and we uh we got a uh a, what is it, a Verbo or like a you know an Airbnb kind of place on North Shore. And uh, had a really good time, but you got to know who Jason Hartman is. He's he's very, let's just say he's got a lot of money. He's like Kiyosaki level of money. Okay, he made a lot of money in uh, in real estate. He does his online thing. Um, he doesn't have a wife. Doesn't have kids. Live in the digital nomad dream. Has a dog. Um, but so my wife and I said, hey, why don't you come to Tahoe? We're going to be here for, you know, for a week. Why don't you come and hang out? we got a place that's got, you know, fenced backyard so you can bring your dog. And so we're up there and like, he, and and Jason shows up and Jay, like, I don't know, maybe it's just because I, I know what kind of money he makes and what kind of lifestyle he lives in Palm Beach, Florida. Right. And I, I got him there and like, we're in like, like the North Shore of, of Lake Tahoe is much more, uh, let's just say, uh, rural <laughs> than like the South Shore. South Shore is where all the tourism and all the casinos and everything are. So we're on this shore and, you know, we're going to restaurants, we're going to some nice places and there's still a lot of high end places to go. But I'm thinking, you know, this guy's used to like five star hotels. This guy, and here we are in a, in a like, a, I mean, it's a nice place. Don't get me wrong. We, we, we spent a good chunk of change for this place, but it's not like going and staying at like uh, the Centric or staying at, you know, these hot, these top end hotels and so i'm thinking oh well this is what you know maybe maybe he thinks that this is like the lifestyle here in like tahoe kind of thing and so i'm kind of like thinking okay well that's what uh, this is me and my my brain he like completely is like loving every second of all this then i go to connecticut and i'm out there and i'm hanging out with uh with the savo brothers and they have the same feeling about me when i get there right because i'm like the richest guy they know who will hang out with them and like sit down and, and, you know, eat pizza with them and work with them and do all this kind of stuff. And they're like, I hope, I hope the hotel's okay. Mr. Rolo. Mr. <laughs> Rolo. <laughs> <Dude. laughs> I like, it's me, man. Like, hey, like, where, yeah. Where, where I, you I'm, I'm like you when we are your age. I want to be. And I, I thought about that and I go, you know, we kind of have these like preconceptions about like, if, if you, if you see a guy like Robert Kiyosaki, I know what I'm getting into when I'm hanging out with Robert, but it's like to be considered like that to somebody else who's still in their workaday jobs is kind of, I don't know, it's, it, 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 I don't say it's off putting, but it's uh, it, it sort of woke me up to how I was with another dude who has a lot more money than I do. And I think we need to get to the point where we're like, relating to each other as men rather than relating to each other as brands. And so like when I'm talking to the, to Kevin Savo and he's like, Oh man, you know, is the room? Okay. You know, would you want to go get the right? Can we go to this? Di- Let's go to the freaking Perkins and have some, you know, that is fine dining. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm like, no, dude, it's cool. Let's go. Let's go do this and hang out and talk and just have a cup of coffee kind of thing. And um, and so when I'm looking at that, I'm going, well, you know, for those guys, like I look like I'm the top G and I'm like, dude, I'm I'm definitely not the richest guy, you know. Right. There's yeah. there's guys like on Fresh and Fit and the, the guys that you hung out with in Miami that are way more paid than yeah. I am. Yeah. I'm just here because I like working with you. You guys are hungry and I want to do I want to we're creative. Let's be creative together. Let's create something. Yeah. And um, so I, I have to remember to sort of pull my head out of my own ass when I'm dealing with people who like are in sort of a different Starting. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm I'm like mid range between the Savos and like 
like this, the J- the Jason Hartman's slash Kiyosaki's, right? I'm not that right. paid, but I'm not I'm not in my workaday job anymore. It's a really weird place to be. I, I gotta say. Well, well you've got access. Is- you've got access to all worlds, though, haven't you? Really, because of your mm-hmm. and, and we all have to some extent, you know. But 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 Rolex and Massey, you know, because of your position, because of your you know you're well known and everything, you get access to these high echelon people, but also these you know people who are sort of coming up as well. So you're in a kind of interesting position in the sort of in the middle of the. Uh, or well it's not in the middle but you know what i mean like you have access to all of these different people coming at it from different angles which is pretty mm-hmm. cool actually um I, I mean i personally i i always like to meet people from different walks of life like it's really interesting it's cool to meet like the top g people it's cool to meet people who've got a lot of money but it's equally it's cool to meet people who are down the other side of the scale as well because i think you can learn something from everybody i mean as much as i believe the old adage about the five people that you surround yourself with i think there's a lot of truth in that at the mm-hmm. same time, I don't think you should just shut somebody out just because, you know, they haven't got a, a Bugatti, right? I mean, it's like, mm-hmm. you know, I think that a lot of people you can learn something from regardless of their so- social status. I have got one story about the top G himself, though, Mr. Tate. Um, I interviewed him in London a few years back before he was as, you know, mega as, I mean, he was always, he's, he's always been well known, but before he was as, as much of a mega star as he is now or as notorious perhaps as he is now and i was going to interview him i've this friend of mine's got a flat in central london it's above a chinese restaurant and it's in uh there's a brothel next door and there's like this these 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 chinese women in like stilettos and and fishnet tights like letting the punters in next door and there's a chinese restaurant downstairs and go up into this flat it's all dusty and there's an old sofa and everything old couch and everything and i was going to interview andrew tate there and then i thought oh man i can't interview andrew tate in there do you know what i mean the top G. So I booked a hotel instead and we did it there. But um, yeah, I think in hindsight, I'm quite glad. Because again, it, it, it's, it just, even at that point, you know, their, their notoriety was climbing and you kind of think, oh man, you know, he probably would have been cool with it, to be honest. But it, it, it's one's own perception of how other people are going to think, isn't it? Well, and one thing, using the uh, <clears throat> Sable Brothers as an example, or just younger people, the people starting out or people who have yet to... Re- it's fascinating watching it, and I'm I'm happy to see it because one of the biggest lies I was told or I believed, and it wasn't a, a malicious or conscious lie, is what society tells you is success based on the past, but the future is not the past, and society and the economy and the dynamics change. And so you're 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 shooting backwards. You're trying to aim for a target that was defined as success is what society told you. But what I like about Savo, fresh and fit. Uh, anyone kind of up and coming is that they're doing something different. They're not going after the old traditional thing of whatever success was defined by. And therefore they're, and Rolly, you were talking about this, like where you're trying to figure out the formula to success. There are some general key rules to, to maybe follow again, not screwing up, but I think adaptability and changing to your environment as it evolves, because that's constantly changing. And so seeing someone strike out and and abandoning traditional things like, okay, I'm all for going to college for the legit thing. I'm all for working hard. I'm all for saving up your money. But inevitably, over time, if you don't screw up, you're going to get your food, clothing, and shelter taken care of. Now you got some extra gunpowder to use. That's the time to experiment. That's an outlandish as it sounds, because I was actually quite conservative and risk averse when I was younger. I'm going to study economics and finance. I'm going to get into banking. I'm going to work for an employer. I'm going to work 80 hours a week. I'm going to buy a rental property. Um, That doesn't work anymore. That's an outdated model. If I had not taken the shot, though, to write a book, do a blog, and there was no Mm intention of making money this was not a money making operation when i started my blog in 2004 in order to do this to everybody else there in the world <clears throat> but when you take these whether it's a hobby you take these shots you go on these endeavors i think that is one of the that is more important in the long run than i'd say majoring in engineering mm. getting a good job nine to five and stuff like that taking these shots taking these calculated risks uh, in creativity, entrepreneurship, or or hobbies that isn't, you know, I like to paint. Okay, fine. But creating videos like the Savo brothers do. Mm-hmm. I think that is a bit of advice I would give to a younger person. It's like, yeah, look, get get your ducks in order first. But the, the you know, because Jason Hartman, let's use him for an example. <clears throat> he was a real estate guy. Mm-hmm. That's not common. Now, go back several years ago. I don't know about buying rental property in the 1970s to 1980s. That was 
an unconventional path. He took. Now look, yeah, look where he is now. I don't know about Gammon's background or any pick Tate. I mean, what those guys? I mean, my God, that that's not a conventional path. So I think the what what we would try to take away from this is the traditionalism that only serves so far. And you should not be putting most of your effort into it, only enough to like serve your purposes and needs. But it's it's the the creative aspect, the going out there and trying something new and different aspect. I think that's actually going to be the future. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But we are very lucky at the same time that the social media and the internet is now progressed to the point where it is pretty much everyone's got the same publish button. You know, I mean, it was really only, I mean, even ten years ago, really, it was much more difficult to create yeah. an online presence like it is now. So people, you know. People should take advantage of that. It's really. practically it's it's turnkey right now. Everybody yeah. has a platform. That's that's a whole and, and that's a it's kind of a blessing and a curse because people yeah. who probably shouldn't have a platform do have a platform right now. Mm. And that's, that's um, my big fuck up in the last ten years or whatever was I, I started my YouTube channel in like two thousand nine, mm. and I had built up five thousand followers pretty quickly, and you know I had a platform still fighting in the UFC, all that stuff. But I got I got married and, you know, and my fuck up was listening to her and like giving up my frame and not putting the time I was into making videos. If I would have kept doing training videos and, you know, travel blogs and stuff like that, I, I'd have way more, you know, 10 years later, I'd have over 100,000 followers that have a lot more success through that. But like I gave that up because the whole happy wife, happy life bullshit. That's mm -hmm. That's my biggest fuck up ever in my life is believing the happy wife, happy life lie. Did any of you guys screw up with women? I, I know I haven't. I'm batting a thousand. Uh, I, I made no mistakes whatsoever. I just, made, I just made that one, but like sometimes the one mistake is all, all, all it yeah. takes. I, I mean, I can always trace my trace everything back to the time I was with the borderline personality disorder girlfriend that I had, right? That was a big mistake, but it was also... I hate to call it a mistake because I learned a lot that a lot of the shit that I know right now, like set me in a, like, you know, I always say this, like guys who sort of find the red pill or they become like sort of unplugged for lack of a better, whatever, like they have that moment of clarity, right? That wouldn't have happened for me had I not been brought to the point that I was at, at the end of that relationship. So when I, I got this, I got this question, by the way, from uh, actually a couple of sources. I was doing an interview with uh, Justin Waller uh, at his place and, on, and he asked me about that. You know, what's your what's your biggest screw up? Right. <laughs> and then or um, then I got asked by uh, by Kevin uh, in that interview on their channel, like uh, what's you know, you weren't always perfect. What was your biggest blue pill moment? Right. You know, what was it? And I'm I I'm really hesitant to like go into too much detail about that because everyone wants to psychoanalyze you over your mistakes. Right. So it's like it's almost like women asking you who hurt you. Because there has to be something that turns you into this horrible, you know, incorrigible misogynist. Oh, so it was that girl back when, you know, Susie at the homecoming dance, like, rejected you. And so, therefore, that's what made you this, you know, bitter misogynist for the, at 50 years old, right? That's what they're looking for because it's an easy answer and it's an easy way to dismiss, you know, the, the rational arguments that they have no counter argument for. So they've got to find, you know, the very fact that you even come to these conclusions or have that moment of clarity where you like sort of realize, hey, maybe things aren't actually the way I've been raised and, and conditioned to believe that they actually are. So when I say, you know, what really kind of uh, put me on this path was having to go through the bullshit that I did uh, with, uh, with, with a BPD girlfriend. And then, like, I've got, you know, a guy like, you know, a, an evangelical Christian like Bruce Lawn saying, oh, we need to promote marriage. We got we have to start promoting marriage. You're in a great marriage. How come you're not promoting marriage? How come that's not your your goal? How come that's not your mission statement on on your blog and everything like that? And I try, and you guys know the story. I, 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 I'm happy to say marriage is great. I love my marriage. OK, but I'm not going to endorse it the way marriage is now. And then we get into this two and three hour diatribe as to why that is. But then you get these guys saying, well, you know, don't you think that guys could benefit from your story and everything and your, your prescription? And I go, okay, fine. Here's what you do. You be a beta loser in high school. You get your, you, 
you know, you move away to another you know city, you get uh, cheated on, then you go back to the Hollywood metal scene, and then you get into the metal. There's no, and then turn off all of your social media and all the internet because there's no internet back then. And you want to follow my path, and you want to use me as the template. Well, here's what you have to do: become this you know semi pro rock star in the you know mid '80s. Find you know go get go through the BPD girlfriend, find the girl that wants you to you know drive the car and live happily ever after. Is that what you want me to say? Because when you get to the point where it's like, what's going to make that person successful? Every freaking person is looking for a template. They're looking to have their hands held to live the perfect fucking life. So it's like they want to uh, have 12 rules for life, right? How, how is that working out for you? Here we are five, six years later. I mean, when, when was that? It was published in 2018. How's that working out for you? How's your life now? How, how are you doing better? Because you read the 12 rules for life. Anyone well, trying to tell you they have some pat system of, of a list of them, follow these rules and you live a great life. Anybody who's telling you that is selling you a bill of goods. They're well, selling my bed's, you a my bed's made now. Right. Yes, exactly. But I am I'm like when people gave give me shit about like, oh, Rolo thinks he's he's not getting his props and he's jealous and all these other people are out shining him. And it's like, that's not what I'm asking for. I'm not asking for my I get props. Thank you very much. But you know what I'm asking for? Some fucking accuracy. If you're going to represent the red pill, at the very least, be accurate. At the very least, don't like, you know, you take side routes and to, to build your brand. I mean, if you're going to be an ambassador or something, you're going to be a representative for like the, the manosphere or whatever, at least get the story straight. So when I'm talking about that, it's like I'm not really looking for like, you know, props or anything. I just want people to be like a little bit more accurate because they come back to me. And say, hey, Rolo, untangle all this stuff for me. And I'm not going to do that anymore. <laughs> what? But this is an interesting. Because, um, <clears throat> primarily after... because they want to have, they want to, you to show them how to live. They want to have a, a, a list of things to go through. They want, a, like, they'll give me grief for saying, I don't have a practice. I don't have a solution. Like, what's the, where are the concrete solutions here? What should we do? How should we live our lives, Rolo Tomasi? You know how you can live your life? You can take this data and you can build a better life for yourself. And stop asking me. The bigger problem isn't the fact that I'm not giving you solutions. It's the fact that you're not finding the solutions for yourself. Could we, could we make a, draw a distinction here, a very interesting, important one. Peterson married his high school sweetheart, right? Oh, there's a story behind well, that. Too. No, I know, but, but he yes, married his high school. You're correct. So just, you're correct. Just, yes. no, don't barf all over the example. Just let, let me get my point here. So Peterson comes from like what would be an academic background, not only uh, literally because he is in academia, but it it's scripted on paper almost. So Peterson never had the bipolar girlfriend. I had the bipolar girlfriend. You had the bipolar girlfriend. Fitch, you had... Um, uh, you a wife. yeah, you had a wife. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I do want to delve into Troy's background mm -hmm. a little bit, but what's interesting is it's the uh, theoretical. Like, if I would not be here, I, I I did a video called "Thank Your Enemies." I would not be here if it was not for my bipolar psycho uh, psycho ex girlfriend. I would not be here for pretty much all the enemies in my life, and without these trials and tribulations, we would not have the edge or the authenticity or the calluses and the battle scars that we do. And now Peterson is, is right. He, he's, he's not wrong in the stuff that he says, uh, but you know, Rolo has a complete more edge and uh, uh, flavor and spice to him that like, give me a choice to hang out with who I want Rolo or Peterson. Well, Peterson might show up and not stand me up, but I'd still prefer to hang out with Rolo because it's good. Hey, be would, would Peterson go all the way to rapid city to hang out with you? You know what? I appreciated the 43 <laughs> seconds you hung out with me. It was would a Peterson great, it was a great Tammy time Peterson with him too. Hmm? I, but, well, hmm? see, I'd rather, no, I'd rather hang out with, but my point it, it's, it's a, uh, uh, not an irony, a, a paradox mm -hmm. where we're trying to give you guys advice to avoid the mistakes. Like, Dude, had I known, had I known as whatever a 22, 23 year old kid when I met the the crazy girl, I, I would have like walked like on the I can remember the date where she started acting up and I thought, what what's wrong? And I must have done something wrong because you always assume <laughs> you're wrong and society's right. I should just like left her there, had her get a cab home because there were cabs. There was no Uber back then. 
I would have avoided the pain. But without having that pain, I would not have come to the, I really would not be here if it was not for, for that individual among other people. Mm. And so it, it's, I, I think that if we give you guys this advice, you're going to avoid a lot of pain and hurt. But I have a feeling you will go on to make new mistakes that you would also learn uh, these valuable lessons in, in other ways, but you can advance. But please listen to us because we've been there. Peterson is right, but he's academic. I don't want him, like, if I need someone, a survivor, I'm not picking Peterson. All right. I'm probably going to pick Fitch because he could fight. And um, <laughs> plus, he'll have that, you know, SWAT no, team. Th theory that, versus uh, actual application is, is hugely different. And I think, um, Peterson represents largely academic, that academic um, mindset of it. You mm -hmm. know, they read a bunch of books, they have a bunch of theories, but they haven't actually been in the shit. And, you know, the person who's been in the shit is probably, you know, it's like, for me, it's like somebody who does practices katas. Oh, well, in theory, mm -hmm. I can block the punch with this kata, whatever. Mm -hmm. But then you have the street fighter who's who's been in three 300 street fights. Who Who do you think is going <laughs> to... Win, win an actual fight which guy do you think is actually going to know more about violent fighting and violence the guy who's just talking about theories and katas and just doing them just doing the moves or the guy who's actually going out and fighting people skin like, in the game right. yeah skin in the game you actually have some experience and that's i talk about this with one of my uh, uh my my students you know he hunts and he has friends, you know, and we're in California. So like some of those friends, they got all the fancy gear. They got all the, the nicest, newest gun. They got the, the best optics, all the laser pointer bullshit, everything on it. Everything's, you know, precisely dialed in, whatever. Their grouping is, is magnificent when they're sitting down and they're, they're, they're shooting a, a stationary target. But he takes them out in the field and they, they see a pig and they got to they gotta shoot the pig. And, they're, uh, 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 and the pig's gone because they're all theory they're all theory they're not in mm. the shit they're not experiencing it yeah i'm saying uh, i'm not saying don't <clears throat> one of the main complaints i have about the younger guys is they don't go out and ask girls which which i understand the the hurdles in the statistics and sure you've probably seen this you put people out in the field you make them go and get their bruises and take their lumps correct mm. yes absolutely and it's amazing how Many guys find it incredibly difficult still with all of this knowledge that's available and all of this information that's out there. But the fundamental thing of having to walk up to somebody that you are attracted to and go and say hello is incredibly hard for, for a lot of guys. What the, Troy, did you have any bipolar girls? I'm kind of curious because you have a very tortured and interesting background. A lot of people don't. By the way, everyone should go get Troy's book, uh, How to Be an Asshole, uh, because you, you get to see the young, the, 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 uh, evolution of Troy Francis, but you must have had, and, and not, not standard. Okay. Don't date a single mom. There must've been something else unique that, that is not already canon within the red pill community. Uh, advice. Oh, mate, I mean, they're all, they're all bipolar, mate, to be honest. Anybody who dates me is bipolar. Right. Right. But did, was there anything else you screwed up? Like, uh, Adam Piggott back in the day, he said, let us make love. He would not, <laughs> it was horrible and cringy. But nothing like there wasn't a one girl that stood out or you took a yeah, another I mean, lesson you could share with everyone? Um, there's certainly. Yeah. I mean, look, I've certainly got into relationships that I shouldn't have done. I've got into relationships with women that I shouldn't have been with. You know, that there were red flags early on. And I just did like many of us, you know, I disregarded those red flags. I just got into something that was far too serious. I mean, I've made the whole gamut of mistakes, really, from e effectively being a prototype incel, you know, back in the day when I was in, when I was a teenager to becoming somebody who just kind of went crazy with the whole dating thing for about, for about two decades and just, and just, you know, marauded around, just trying to fill my boots to the greatest extent possible. And, um, but also getting into relationships along the way with unsuitable people, falling into one itis, ignoring red flags. I mean, yeah, I've, I've done the whole thing, man, to be honest. Um, I mean, there was certainly, I certainly got into a relationship with somebody and ended up moving in with them um, a mm. while back. And uh, that's a, a mistake I've only actually made once. Well, actually twice in my life, once when I was very young and then once, uh, you know, a bit more, a bit more recently. And um, that was a really, that was a pretty tough time for various reasons. Um, you know, I don't look back on that with any fondness. So I think the lesson from, for me is, 
I mean, for God's sake, don't rush into anything. Do you know what I mean? And, and I mean, people talk about vetting, vetting women that you're going to get involved with. And I think it is important. At the same time, I'm also not misty eyed about vetting either, because I think you can only vet to a certain degree. You know, you can vet and see, you know, you can check off the old tick list. You know, has she got tattoos? Has she got piercings? Blah, blah, blah. I mean, there's obvious things that you're going to steer clear of. But I think that you can't fully vet until you've seen somebody under pressure. And that takes time. Mm. So you need time. You know, don't rush into anything, for God's sake. Don't rush into moving in with somebody, especially because you can really get yourself screwed over if you do that. I would say a, a general lesson I learned <clears throat> about uh, women. I'm, you guys can tell me if you have the same uh, observation. If I could convey a mistake is how much time and let's call it resources, not just time and money, but also psychological resources. Because look at the uh, the red pill. It's, it's all about guys trying to get girls. Uh, all that effort and resources I spent on trying to get girls was exhausting. Mm -hmm. And it came at the sacrifice of other pursuits that I could have pursued that would have actually increased my chances with girls. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that, that it's very hard to, to reprioritize and to jettison that, that desire because it's hardwired, it's biological. Your, uh, men are emotional. There's let's not deny that. But that is something that if I could convey to younger men to not get all worked up and not put, I'm not saying don't chase. I'm not saying everyone keeps calling me black pill. I say, no, no, no. You got to reprioritize and, and really get a critical assessment of, of, of what's going on. You know, look, go ahead. And, and say, you uh, well, that, yeah. That's all it was. That, I, was just, I'm, I, got, I got something to, to add to that too. Cause I was just, too. I was just, uh, I was just, I was talking to Justin actually, and this kind of came to me during that conversation. I really need like to develop this into an essay of, of some kind. But when we talk about money, muscles, and game, right? Those are that's the trifecta. If you go and you look at any male self improvement channel, it usually deals with either fitness, uh, how do I get the girl, the game, or mm -hmm. deals with uh, you know be on point with your entrepreneurship or what's your hot side hustle or how are you making money today kind of thing. And those are like the three areas that guys usually find themselves deficient in. So there's like, okay, most guys are fat. Let's just be honest. Okay. Like 75% of, yep. the, of the population. Yep. Be fat. So they're going to be struck like fitness guys. You got your work cut out for you. Fuck. I wish I was a fitness guy. I wish I could do that, man. I'd be making money hand over fist, but I'm, that's not me. Man, nobody's going to take a fitness advice from me. Right. I mean, I'm in good shape. Thank you very much. I know it works for me, but I'm not, I'm not like conceited enough to like start a fitness channel. So um, so there's that aspect. Then there's the money side of things. Do I get paid? Yes. But do I get paid as much as, you know, John from Modern Life Dating? Do I get paid as much as, uh, you know, Justin Waller or Myron Gaines or any of these other guys? No, of course not. But that's not my, my shtick. I take my money and I put it into other projects, right? I don't sit on my money. I don't let my money just stagnate. I go and I use it and I put it. Sometimes they fail and sometimes they don't, right? So I'm taking it and I'm, I'm investing it into people who are promoting, you know, red pill ideas at least right so um so nobody's going to take financial advice from rollo tomasi much as i have like richard hart and these other crypto guys and i'm working with miguel i'm i try to get you know sort of delve into all of those things with like kiyosaki and gammon and mcelroy and the rest of these dudes and so i've got that kind of tied up but like my of course my forte is is a you know game and and intersexual dynamics and the psychology behind that so i've got all that but here's what i understood after the conversation with justin is that there's synergies between all three of those so and i hate to even use the word synergies but that's like the only you know buzzword i can come up with right now so the the conditions of one of those affects the conditions of the other or it manifests different things in the other so for example you go from being a fat ass the, the fitness side you go from being a fat ass to being you know you get yoked you get you get down to you know your body fat's down and you start looking better that's going to affect what your game is like because now you are getting reinforced positive reinforcement from women who are actually you know are attracted to you and then they are they're at, responding to you in a different way because you look different and you're used to women rejecting you and being you know kind of like you're just basically invisible you're a non entity to them to being someone that they wreck it you suddenly become visible how does that affect your game how does that affect your even your money at that point like how does that affect what you're doing to develop that side of the trifecta there how does that affect that what if you suddenly go from being like a poor a dirt ass poor guy and you make a, you make a you know a million dollars inside of a year how does that affect your game 
How does that affect your, your fitness? It might negatively affect your, your fitness. It just depends. But there, the conditions of all three of those have effects that manifest in the other two. So if you've got, if, if you're grossing out in one, it usually means you're like deficient in the other. So what people do is they play to their strengths, right? If I've got a lot of them, if I'm Richard Hart and I've got more money than God, why do I want to go get into the gym when I can just go buy pussy whenever I want to? Right. Why learn game when all I really, you know, as long as she's sucking my dick and I got the money to do it, then what's, you know, what's the big, I mean, I'm okay with the transaction. Then why bother with those other aspects? You see? So there's synergies and they can be negative or they can be positive depending on how you develop those things. So when people tell me, Oh, don't chase women, chase X. Well, what the fuck does excellence mean? Does it mean making more money or does excellence mean getting into the gym? Because when you chase those things, you're going to affect the other of the other two of the of that trifecta. So when we say what's excellence, I would say excellence is all three of those and maximizing the potential in all three and understanding the synergies between all three. Because when those come into like those three are like all hitting on eight cylinders, that's when you have really tight and good frame. And that's all three of those add up to what the world that you create that other people, not just women, but other people want to be associated with and want to come into. I, I would even expand it beyond all three, uh, because again, one thing, <clears throat> it wasn't that I was like, there's, there's what you were lied to about. And then there's just stuff. No one ever told you you're young. You think you're going to live forever. You don't think about finiteness or that you're going to die. But I wish earlier on someone had instilled in me the concept that this ends. Now that was, that mm -hmm. was blocked because I was brought up in a Christian household and you're going to live forever and, and Jesus, but dogs don't go to heaven because it was Wisconsin Synod, not fun Christians, very not fun Christians. Um, but, but as I got older and I'm like, yeah, I, but I'm like, wait a minute, what if, what if there isn't an afterlife, you know, and finiteness or the, the statistical chance that this could be it, we don't know. That really kicked my ass in high gear to pursuing excellence in every day. To the point, Roland, you and I have had a conversation about this. Like, how do you turn it off? How do you calm down? How do you relax and just enjoy the moment? And the answer is you don't. And you're you're Christian, <clears throat> so you even have the luxury of, well, I, there's this little thing called death. And then, boom, it continues on. So I'm, I'm very envious in that regard. But I wish people had taught me that there is only so much time and you got to make it count. Mm -hmm. And if anyone was looking for a swift kick in the ass and incentive mm -hmm. to go forth and do and become excellence, uh, excellent <clears throat> in whatever capacity regard, that was it. And Fitch, I mean, I, I a perfect example. You've gotten into the ring. You got into physical excellent shape and done something that less than one percent of one percent of men actually do. I mean, there must have been some kind of uh, uh, impetus for that or some kind of incentive to pursue excellence in that regard. I, I wanted to retire early. Like I had, I had the idea of having a lot of land and, and be able to train people out of my barn. I wanted to build a gym in my barn. Like I so want whatever. to go to Fitch land. I so want to go. Right? To Fitch and, and that was the thing is like, I'm going to, I'm going to be a pro athlete because I want to be retired and never have to work again after 40 and just do projects and fun stuff that I want to do and spend time with my kids. That was, that was the whole plan. So I was like, I, I buckled down young. I was working my ass off in high school, junior high. Like I was training to be a professional when I was when I was a little kid, basically. I wasn't like, YOLO, I got to go party all the time. I got to chase girls all the time because I'm young and that's when you do these things. Like I didn't I didn't buy that shit. I was like, I looked around, I could see people working and, you know, going into the office at 55, 60 years old, look, it looked miserable to me. Like the, the people I saw around doing those things, they weren't happy. Their lives didn't seem better. They didn't live lives that I wanted, basically. So I was like, I don't want to do that. I gotta, I gotta bust my ass. I don't want to be like all these other people because they're gonna. I want to get married instead. I'm kidding. They're gonna I'm get, kidding. they're gonna get trapped in that, in that whole thing. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I wanted to get married young and have you know twenty kids. <laughs> like I, you know, like that's success to me. If you have a bunch of money and you don't have any children, I kind of consider you a failure. <laughs> Like, what did you do work so hard for? Where's your legacy? What are you passing down? But like, not everybody wants that. That's fine. Um, but I knew that, you know, your, your teens and your 20s were the most important time to bust your ass. Like, those were the years that make the rest of your life. If you're, if you're taking your teens and your 20s for granted and you're just out partying, 
your your 30s, 40s, 50s are going to be rough. It's going to be a lot harder. You're borrowing from your future to pay for your present. Yeah. Yep. Just like a credit card, right? Yeah. I was going to say is I, I don't necessarily see guys who don't have kids as being like sort of failures, but I will, I will say this is that I think that guys who, who are set like there's, and I, I'm not going to name names because there's several actually, but the guys who are like out there in the hustle economy and, and playing the game who tell me I want to have kids in the future. I still, you know, I'm doing this for now and they're like 35, 38, whatever, but I want to have kids and I want to settle down. I want to have a wife eventually have that. And it's like, that would destroy every aspect of the things that make you the success that you are today right now, because it would remove your ability to be able to, like, you got, I hate to use him as an example, but if you look at a guy like Mike Cernovich, for example, when Mike Cernovich had no children, he was on top of his game. He was on 60 Minutes. He was out there doing his thing. Like all of the things that we remember Mike Cernovich for happened prior to him having, well, now three kids, right? Once he had the first one, it sort of uh, tapered off. Once he had the second one, well, now he's dad. And he ch pivots and he changes his mind about everything. And his brand becomes about being a dad. And he becomes more tradcon and Christian. And everything else comes along with that. Everything that's expected. It's the prodigal son returneth. And then by the time the third kid comes around, then he's a completely different brand than he was when he had no children and what i think is when i see when i listen to like a tate or i hear somebody like that say well you know i'm actually a godly man and i really want to have kids in the future i'm like when when is that going to happen when you're 50 when are you going to do that when are you, when you you're going to basically give up all of this or give up at least part of this to be a dad i don't see that happening I don't see that happening anytime soon because your ego and your personality and your brand of me is based on you being single and not having kids. Mm -hmm. And so when I look at this, I think the worst thing that could possibly happen to these guys is if the girl like actually had a kid, you know, the, 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 some girl that they're with actually had a child. And now they have to sort of like, it's the Tucker Max thing. And I know uh, uh, Rich Roy knows Tucker Max, right? Tucker Max yeah. used to be this incorrigible bad boy back in the day. And he had what was his, his book was like, well, I hope they serve beer in hell. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, I'll, show, I'll, I'll go dig up the picture here. But it's like the cover of the book is him with just some random 304 next to him. And her face is blanked out. And it says your name here, right? <laughs> and that was the cover of the book. He knocks some girl up. They get, you know, they have the baby together. And his next book is Mate with Dr. Jeffrey, uh, Jeff Miller. And now it's the reversal of that. His face is blanked out. Her face is the one showing. And over, over the top of it, it says your, your, your name here. It's almost, it's like almost the perfect, like, like reversal of what he used to be. And it's like, that's a brand pivot. And you can no longer be that same guy that you were before. Now, that's been guys have done that since you know from, since ancient times right but the thing is is now those guys are dependent financially and their revenue stream is dependent on them being that personality so when they get the kid and when they turn into something else they have to pivot on that they have to turn into to you know dad oh i was like that before but i've learned my lesson oh now i'm with this girl and i'm gonna be a good dad because that's what this kid needs right okay well where the fuck was that when you were you know college frat guy and i hope they serve beer in hell well you've got it you have no other choice but to pivot and you know what that pivot is never going to be as exciting or as interesting or as profitable as the other one that you had before but you that you were authentically were before your external environment yes. changed and commanded you to change, like that's yes. who you were. And that, that's got to suck living a life. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's got to suck living a lie. I, I can't imagine that. Well, dad brands um, are pretty, pretty dull, aren't they? Let's be honest. I mean, if it's just posting on Instagram, taking your kid to the baseball game and stuff like that, if that's, if you're reliant on that for your income, I think that's a, that's not a great place. Well, to that's be, one I step think. away from the good man project. Well, yeah. but yeah. Apart, apart from anything, apart from anything else, <laughs> apart from anything else, because some of these people monetize their own kids, don't they? They're basically posting their own kids online in order to, yeah, to, to, to be legit, to be to the accessories, right? That's what makes yeah. them legit is having their children. They, oh, here we are, baseball practice. Here we are, cooking hot dogs and everything else. Like for John Fitch, he's already that's already been part of that. That's his life, yeah. Published, right? You didn't go suddenly and go. Oh, I was a bad boy, but now here's my kids, right? And you use them as like sort of a like a, a marketing scheme. That's I've been the same asshole <laughs> my whole life. Like my views haven't changed a lot of stuff. I but you know the uh, the one itis and the, and the and the the, the, the 
failed marriage, whatever that stuff, like that was me losing frame. If I would have just stayed the asshole I was and kept the mindset that I had, like I would have avoided a lot of huge problems. And yeah. these guys, you know, everything might be nice and rosy right now and they've made these pivots, but it, you know, just wait, <laughs> like there's a good chance that they're not, those things are not going to work out and they're not going to be in a good place. And see, one thing, Fitch, is, is you're honest about it. I'm wondering how many of these people got to put up, like, no one's life is perfect, but how many of these people have to put up, like, this fake veneer? Like, Peterson, his his life was hell. I'm getting an echo. Has someone got an echo on? Sorry. Maybe you. But, uh, and he's had a, a, a back, hang on, let me, let me mute. Check, 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 check. I think it's Fitch. Okay, it's gone now. Okay. Uh, but anyway, having a to put and, and Peterson was kind of dragged into it. He he didn't he didn't really necessarily ask for this, but you're a semi or quasi public figure, and you got to put up this front. I've always found it to just be myself, flaws included. You know, by the way, I'm never having children. Uh, in case you guys were wondering, I I will live the the nice bachelor lifestyle uh, unencumbered. Uh, but uh, though, if a woman wants to pay me two million after tax to have my seed, you may, with a huge legal disclaimer. So there still might be a shot for little little cappies running around. But no, this is this is it. But I can't imagine what that would be like. Oh crap! I got a girl pregnant, or oh crap, um, X happened, and now I have to change this. That now you now that's a real job. That's a that's a real job. Right. I think a lot of guys when they get to that pivot and they have kids, whether it's by design or not. When they get to that pivot, that's when they have to turn like they eat their own, right? Oh, I would hate to live such an empty lifestyle as these guys. I would hate that. And I, it's almost as if there's like, I don't know, it's contempt, but if they have to kind of like go against what they used to be, right? Um, for instance, like when I look at like Roosh, when Roosh made his pivot to being Orthodox Christian Roosh, you know, Unabomber and the freaking backwoods, you know, guy. Unabomber. Yeah. I mean, when, when he made that pivot, of course, you can't say anything about that because if you go and you say, I don't think he's actually sincere. This is just a brand pivot for him. People go, oh, it's really, and they, so it's an attack on their religion. And so I just like, okay, whatever. If you want to follow Roosh, be, be my guest. But like, I have known Roosh since like 2009 and I know the pivots that he's made throughout this time. Maybe it's sincere. Maybe it's not. I don't know. And I don't care. But the thing is, is like when guys get to that point, then they look back at the guys or they look at the dudes who are living a lifestyle that they had before and they have no other choice but to be sort of critical of that because now it's prodigal son returneth, right? So now they're like, oh, well, they're going to disavow all of the their their bad boy ways. And the easiest way for them to do that and sustain a brand and still make money off of it is to point the finger back at the guys who are doing what they did probably, you know, five or six years ago. And now they're bad for doing that. So when people bring this up to me, I, I again, I got into this with, with Ruslan. I'm like, what is, you know, is it better to be married? Or is it better not to be married? Oh, are you healthy or are you not healthier? Do you make more money? Do you not? Is it better to have kids? Is it not better to have kids? Because what should we be promoting as like sort of the best life path? And I, I told him, I said, I don't give prescriptions. I don't work in shoulds. I deal in what is. So sh am I living, am I a success? I don't make as much money as a lot of these guys do, but I have a kid. I have a, a, a wife of 26 years. Am I a success? Some people will say no. They'll say you're a blue pill chump for, for being married. And then other people will say, well, yeah, you've done everything the right way. You're pro-social, you know, lesser alpha, whatever you you're, you're faithful to your wife and you have a kid and everything. So in some, to someone else, I'm a raging success and other people, I'm just this blue pill chump failure who should get off the internet and stop talking about shit that he doesn't know about. So what is the definition there? So when I look at a guy like George Gammon, or I look at Jason Hartman, or I look at these guys, or even Aaron Clary, very good example, right? Guys who are not married, who are still sort of like free agent lifestyle, right? They're very free, very free. I remember a motorcycle ride later. Let me tell oh, you, did you guys see the picture of me success. smoking a cigar in the morning? Did you see the picture? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I know, from the hot tub, no less. From the hot tub, yes. yes. <laughs> so who's, who's, who's the success? Who's who gets to define that? The guy who has two kids and a wife and like Rolla Tomasi, who's got a child and, and been married for 26 years. And I go, he should really man up. He should really grow up. Start wearing brown shoes and get, you know, find something sensible and find a good little old wife for yourself and, and settle down and have some kids there, Aaron. Because if you don't, you're not a success. Thanks, Dennis. Well, are you gonna listen to that? Are you gonna listen to me? 
Am, am, am I the or or is is Andrew Tate a success? Because that's exactly what like guys like Patrick Bet David and Ruslan were talking about. They're like, oh, he's a real stud. Okay, but he is like living a lifestyle that is at the antithesis of what you talk about on your own shows. So is he a stud? Is he a success? Or is he not? Well, he's he but says he's a Christian. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, yeah, great, but do, I don't see any pictures of him coming out of like mass. <laughs> but it's all very it's all very subjective, isn't it? And it's yes. this, this is it's a yes. very emotional, emotive sort of area. This I think, and people are so like caught up in their own ego investments with this stuff. I mean, there's a dude in the chat, big uh, Dan in LA, who's saying, "I found that most people who don't want kids tend to come from broken homes. They forego working on their own past and use worldly pursuits as a band aid to fill the void." But equally. You could say that some people use kids Thank as, you, a Dr. Floyd. as a band aid to fill the void. Mm. You know, I would I would say so, in, in uh, general. Go, I'm sorry, Troy. Go ahead. No, so I'm just saying. So, so you get people who are very ego invested in having kids, having a family. That is the right thing to do. That's the right thing for civil, you know, man up and all of that. And then you get people who are very invested in in the, completely the opposite. And I don't think one is right or or the other is right, really. I think it's just a subjective thing. And I think people have to make their own decisions on this stuff. But the only thing I would say for myself is you've got, I think you've kind of got to be honest with yourself about what you actually want. Know thine self. Exactly. Yep. exactly. And, and have the frame to keep that and go for it, regardless yes. of what other outside forces are telling you. I would, you know, do I would what you want to do. I had people, you know, when I started fighting, like nobody was fighting, nobody knew what it was. And I had people tell me, you know, I had friends tell me, he's like, what are you doing? Just go get a job. Hey, Cut your you know, hair. Stupid. Just go get a job. Find a wife or whatever. You know, and it's like I you think can't they, listen to them. Like that's where success lies. Is what makes you happy. Are you living the life you want to? Like that's where success lies. And and generally, you're always going to want a little bit more. But that's where your drive and your purpose comes from. And that's that's going to make your life better because you actually have something you're working towards. But what? if you're not willing to fight for what makes you happy you're not going to be you know what? if you want if you want two girlfriends three girlfriends no kids if you just want sugar babies if you just want to be a bachelor your whole life that fine that if you're living life you want to on your terms that's success mm -hmm. if you want to live like andrew tate that's that's great if you want to be the guy with 10 kids and goes to church every sunday and and, and on wednesdays also like if that's what you wanted and that's what makes you happy, then you're successful. Congratulations. Like I would, I would matter add what all the sad people who have shitty lives, who are unhappy with their lives say about it. I would add to this. It's very important <clears throat> because uh, there's a lot of like, say the Andrew Tate, which if you want that, you can go ahead and have that. Um, but when, when I was younger, you got government teachers, parents, religion, uh, corporations advertising all showing you oh look at this and i love walter to death walter's a great guy but that posing by a ferrari posing next to this boats and hoes and all that that okay you can have that if you want but do not be influenced by it what what i wanted is what i got now and it is a it is a goddamn tragedy it took me this long to get here because i could have had it when i was 18 just no one told me. Everyone said, go to college, be be conservative. That, that, I don't mean politically, but fiscally. Uh, work really hard. That, 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 that. All I wanted to do was hike in the mountains. And if just to show uh, um, young men and, and the three women that are listening, if you don't <laughs> listen to the adults and you're honest with yourself, say, what do I want? You can usually get it even before you're 20. All I had to do was move to Denver. Or move to South Dakota, Rapid City, gain a year of residency, and then go to college. And I would have had mountains in my backyard. Mm. But, oh, no, I got to go where there's reciprocity. Oh, no, I have to study something that that will pay off. I have to be a – no. It's And figure out what you want to do, what your life is. Mm. And if you pursue that, you would be amazed at all the advice and the obfuscation and how much more complicated – Older people, wise older people, the wisdom and the advice they give you will just delay that. Because I was like, well, couldn't I just become a carpenter and kind of make some? Oh, no, you were not going to make any money as a carpenter or a plumber or whatever. You got to go to college. All that did was delay my success by 15 freaking years. 
And if you're much more linear and laser focused and you say, okay, what do I want to do? Heck, just moving to the area you want to move will mm. accomplish like 60% of the stuff that you want in life. So I would, I would say another bit of advice, don't listen to your elders. Look at your elders and say, are they successful in the capacity they want to be successful? Are, do they know what they're talking about? Or are they just a teacher bitching and whining because they don't have enough money, but they got three months off and they hate their job? Are your parents miserable and divorced and poor? You should not be listening to these people. What do you want to do? And then go and do it. And it's as simple as that. I'm looking at this uh, Renegade show. has a really good super chat here. It says, happiness is doing the things you enjoy and spending time with good people. Success is not having to ask permission to do it. I would, I would also, I, I think that's a good comment, by the way, but um, I would also add this is that too many people think that happiness, like, oh, what's happiness? What's, let's ask women how happy they are as compared to when the 1970s or something like that is self-reporting how, what's your, it's not, they're not asking about happiness. They're asking about their state of contentment is what they're really asking. Like, how content are you in your life? Or did things work out for you the way that you had hoped that they were going to work out? We equate that with happiness. We have this misguided idea that we can be happy all the fucking time. That's why we prescribe freaking antidepressants for women, like in, you know, like they're giving them out like M&Ms, right? So when we look at like our concept, our fundamental concept of what like is, will make us happy or what is like a sustainable state of happiness, it's really about contentment. And unfortunately, this, the, what defines humanity is our discontent, not our content. And that's actually a feature, not a bug, right? I don't want to be content. God forbid I'm content. Because it will, I will stagnate and I will not move on to the next thing. I will not climb the next mountain if I'm just content with the mountain that I just climbed. Most people are like that to some degree, right? Then contentment is not something you will ever find in any permanent sense. And that's a good fucking thing. It's how you deal with that discontent that, that defines you as a person. Do you deal with discontent destructively? Or do you deal with it constructively? Are you creative? And you go, you know what? I'm discontent. I want to get from point A to point B. How am I going to get to that point? And you do it creatively and you're, 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 you know, innovate. That's how innovation happens. That's how inventions happen. That's how like, you know, great ideas happen. It's going from point A to point B. It's not being content. Human race is where it's at. Like a species. We're not the apex species on this planet because we're like, oh, I'm just going to find nirvana and bliss. I'm going to be content. Get the fuck out of here. That is, uh, you're never going to be permanently happy. And that's why like trying to make a woman happy is a fool's errand. Yeah. Yes. The right, fundamental nature is to not be content. So what about happiness? When we look at happiness and I, I look at the, um, uh, Look at the uh, the studies on this, by the way. But like the uh, there are studies about emotion in general. But when people are the happiest, it's when they're doing that, when they're moving from point A to point B. Why do people get depressed? Because it's an emotion that is meant to inspire them and kick them in the ass to move from a state that is unsustainable to a better state. Why is it that like people want to be happy? Well, you're happiest when you're doing it. And that's exactly what they find is like when a guy is in his zone, he's in that flow state, he's doing the things that he thinks is his calling or his purpose or whatever else. When he's in the process of going from one state to another state and in that process, he's happy. That is meant to incentivize you to get to that other state. It's not a permanent condition. And we are idiots for thinking that it could be because we make a lot of money on that. Read this book, do these things, uh, follow 12 steps, and you'll be you'll have a happy life at the end of the book. Get the fuck out of here. It's the process of getting from like rule number one to rule number 12, right? Then yeah. that's the problem. I was happiest and now it's all over. And it turns out that my hero spent, you know, I don't know, two years in a freaking Russian rehab. Well, I still felt happy when I was going from rule one to rule 12. But now I don't because I'm not content anymore and I'm moving on to the bigger and better thing. That's why I was joking around about that. Are you a better person now in 2022 because you read 12, 12 Groups for Life back in 2018? Some people might say they are because they have like, you know, they sunk cost fallacy, right? They don't want to like say, oh, I wasted my time on that. But the other, the, the long and the short of it is, is that we are happiest when we are doing, not when we arrive, but in the process of arriving is what when we're happy or when we're mad or when we're motivated or when we're sad or we're depressed. Those emotions are meant to inspire behavior. It's meant to prompt behavior. The, the other thing as well is the other thing as well is the other thing as well is just to say that life is very long as well. And it's sort of a bit like I think sometimes 
people think, oh, I'll just tick off the 12 steps and then it will all be good and I can sort of just, no. you know, and, and then I can forget about it and sit on top of the mountain. Reality is there's going to be another problem that comes up. There's going to be another hurdle. There's going to be another challenge. There's going to be another thing that you have to you have to deal with, right? Problems are going to keep coming at you. Problems and good things as well, but problems and challenges and issues and the whole totality of life is going to keep coming at you, right? Um so you, what, whatever course of action you take on board in order to, to sort of make things good for yourself or to attempt to make things good for yourself, you've, you've got to have to recognize that's something you're going to have to maintain going forward through the years, through the decades, right? Because otherwise, you're just going to end up, you know, there, there's no precipice to rest on as far as I can see. Have you guys, a role in particular, did you read the menu? The part about the Germans pr uh, immediately after World War II and then in 1970s? Mm-mm. No, I'll I'll I'll. Send only, it I only picked out the first part of. I, I only ripped you off uh, when it was. Uh, we live in a post-marriage society. Okay, so all right. Well, but we, I have to get through it. If if you get the time, audiobook or whatever. Um, let's let's because uh, uh, Troy, he's a very busy man, and he has to move on to the next step. Uh, so let's go through these super chats real quick, yeah. and then we'll we'll round up with uh, uh some parting advice. Black Channel, Aaron, what's that song from? No, 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 no. I just came up with that ditty, like what a girl is saying when she rejects you. She just sings, no, 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 no. So it's like maybe the it's song. Huh? It's like the thong song. I, I, I don't know where it came from. Uh, Black Channel, five bucks again. Aaron, you would know, is a high school diploma different from a government high school diploma, private high school or charter school? Are they all accredited the same way? Uh, no one cares about your high school diploma here. GED or not, it, it's whether or not you got a degree. And as long as it's accredited, it's the type of degree that matters, not um, not the fact that you have a college degree. It's what you're no one even cares about GPAs or anything like that here in the United States. Uh, scrolling down, I apologize for the thing. Did you know, Mad Five Canadian Bucks? Troy, when are you taking Rollo and Cappy out approaching? They need to have fun too after Cappy's book of numbers, Troy Francis effort well, or go home. Mate, if you'd have come to Miami earlier in the year, we could all, all have gone out and done some approaching I, stuff. I, I, I have been to Miami. Look, I do not have the energy of Rolo Tomasi where every other day I fly to Miami no, and back. I'm going, I, to uh, Tahoe. I'm going to Tahoe tomorrow. <laughs> uh, hey, Rolo, can you do me a favor? Can you validate that I put a ton of effort into this house and that's dialed oh, God in? Oh, damn. Are you kidding? Yes, yes, yes. It's crazy. Right. It took a lot of effort. That's where I've been. Luis, uh, 20 bucks. I haven't seen him in a while. Luis, thank you very much for the 20 bucks. Hope you're doing well. Uh, Stripey Cat, 20 Australian dollars to join the show. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Stripey Cat. Uh, and don't no more Super Chats because everyone's got to go. I just want to not miss any because I feel bad when we do. Nonstop, Dre, two bucks. Cappy's Manly University. <laughs> Learn to grow six feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> didn't you say you have to break your shins and then like heal your i looked shins? i looked into it yeah they they got the surgeries out there and uh not advised not that advised is, come on you guys know paul right come on man podcast 20 bucks he's gonna come yep. visit later it's comical that so many think that the only measure of success in relationship is marriage most married people stop banging after seven years true uh i think that's it i think we're caught up I did read that other one. Uh, this one, respect to the panel. Uh, Shimishi, 10 bucks. Thank you very much. And I think that's it. I hate this layout that YouTube has for the super chats. We just got, you know, start. you can star super chats and then come back to them now. I can. Uh, the Renegade Show, $20. Happiness is doing things you enjoy and spending time with good people. Success is not having to ask permission to do it. Mm. <clears throat> God almighty. We got a lively chat room here. Uh, let's do this. I will let you guys get going and I'll go and make sure I clean up any missed super chats at the end of this. I think we got them all. I think we're caught up. So, all right. Um, mm -hmm. let's go through it. Final big mistakes or advice you would give other people mm -hmm. that you you screwed up. Troy, go ahead. Be honest with yourself about what you want. Know yourself, as Kathy said earlier on understand yourself spend time getting to know yourself and figure out what you actually genuinely want not what other people are telling you to want whether it's somebody on the internet or somebody in your family or whatever you know just try and figure it out for yourself and then go for that thing because life is very short and very fleeting so we may as well try and get the things that we want to get before we all shuffle off this mortal coil so yeah that would be my advice
And I think okay. I failed to do that in the past. So I'm glad that I've, uh, you know, I've managed to sort of change that a bit now. Cool. Fitch? Uh, yeah. Like, figure out what you want and go after it. You don't have to want what other people want. You don't have to just say or do what society wants. And that can be really hard because, you know, I've, I've been watching a lot of old old movies and TV shows and stuff in the last few months. And there's a lot of messaging. There's a lot of messaging. There's always points in the same directions of, of you know, oh, these are the places everybody everybody cool lives. These are the things everybody who's anybody does. If you don't do these things, you're not a cool person. Like I, I can't think of a show or a movie <clears throat> in recent times at all that that makes living in the Midwest or away from the big cities appealing. Like if anybody from the outside is looking at the stuff, it's all, it's got to be California. It's got to be uh, New York City. If you're not living in those places and you're not aspiring to make it in those places, you're a failure. You're no good. Life's not good. If you're not going to brunches all the time and going to happy hours and doing all these things, your life's not good. I, I, there's zero messaging supporting the other stuff, you know, uh, homesteading or or doing what Cappy's doing up in South Dakota. Like there, there's no there's no positive images of any of those things. So it can be very hard for a young person to to really figure out what they want because they're being told what they should want by everybody else. And you really have to take a look at what, what does fulfill you? What are the things you want? What do you want your life to look like? I mean, do you really want to live in, um, you know, a third world country in a mansion with fancy cars? That sounds cool, but is it really something that's workable every day of your life for 40, 50 years? Or is that, a fantasy, something that you want to you want to dip into for a couple of weeks and then go back to your normal life. You know, you got to kind of examine those things at a young age. And it's, and it's not easy. Um, but figure it out. <laughs> really, it comes down to figuring that out and then holding your frame and, and busting your ass to achieve the things that you want. Cool. Uh, George Bruno's in the house. He oh, kindly boy. had me on his show. Uh, he did like the menu. So, uh, Rolo, go. What do you got? All right. So, biggest mistake and best advice. Here we go. If a little guy with a beard and a bad fitting sports jacket and a red MAGA hat comes up to you and says, Will you speak at my convention in Orlando? You tell him no. Guilty, guilty, guilty. guilty. <laughs> There's your worst mistake and advice in the same sound bite. <laughs> wow. no, I was gonna say is like okay, so but seriously, um, n if you agree with this statement, I've heard. Uh, I think it was uh, J Jay Waller was talking about this. He said like the the best day of his life is when he realized that no one is coming to save you. Like we hear this all the fucking time in the manuscript. No one's coming to save you. You've got to figure the shit out on your own, and you've got to do this. You got to do it yourself. If you agree with that statement but you're asking me or anyone else on this panel for solutions or concrete plans to help you live your life, to have somebody hold your hand through life, you don't fucking get it, okay? If you don't understand the difference between no one is coming to save you and I need 12 rules for life, that's the paradox you have to settle on and you have to figure out for yourself. I don't like. I don't think anybody here offers some sort of like perfect plan for the perfect life and it would be irresponsible of any of us, including myself, to say, here's the here's the template. Here's the magic pill. Here's the here's the the seven rules. And number four will will shock you. <laughs> Anybody telling you that is selling you something. Okay, uh, an easy to follow template program. And so when when that's paradox number one. Paradox number two is you don't get to say, well. I live this perfect, I live this great life because I have kids and I have a wife and I'm, I'm a, a trad con and everything. And then you get to go and say, yeah, uh, Andrew Tate is a badass, and, uh, I would live that life. If I, I, I chose a different direction, but you, you simultaneously admiring one lifestyle while shitting on it in another, in the next breath, you don't get to do that. Make up your fucking mind. What is, what is success to you? What is, what is failure to you and go with that at least be consistent. <laughs> so when I, uh, I'll just leave you with this one that you'll find this in my first book. It's uh, it's a chapter called truth to power. 
and I, I broke it down like this, is that power is not the ability to control other people. It's not the ability to crush their souls into like, you know, martial armies and, and, and you know, tyrannize the populace. Power, the reason why, that's why we have such a negative, you know, view of what power is. And you can find this in like the 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene. Power is not about that. Power is about the extent of the control that you have over the direction of your own life. And sometimes for the guy who's living in the village in freaking Argentina or some third world country, power might be having enough money and having enough influence, enough control to be the the chief of the, the town that he lives in. And that makes him the top G in, I don't know, Chile. So I don't know, wherever the hell he is, right? That might make that guy the, the highest status individual, highest status male in within the context of where that guy is. So here in the United States, if you think that that's, uh, you know, a guy draped over a Lamborghini on a super yacht, okay. But it also might be the fact that you run a business in the Midwest where you're at the top of your game in that particular context. What it boils down to is about being, you're never going to be content, understand that and accept that, but also understand the fundamental nature of power. It is, a, it's not about control. Sometimes it, it might be controlling others so that you can do the things that you want to in your life. And sometimes people do that destructively, yes. But the thing is, is power is really about the amount of control over the direction of your own life and within the context and the framework of, of the environment that you happen to be in. So that's me. Cool. All right, real quick. Um, the one thing that screwed me up the most was uh, listening to old people who didn't know what they're talking about. Your elders generally don't know crap, especially in the West. Um, there's only two people you should listen to. Those are people who are self-made successful people, not inherited, self-made successful. They should tell you what to do. And if you look at people who are failures or not where you want to be in life, the only advice you should take from them is when they tell you what not to do because they have obviously screwed up. If you have failures of parents, failures of elders, or generally teachers telling you what you should do and they are miserable failures in life, do not listen to them. And usually society is wrong. And I'll, I'll tell you this. Right now, the younger kids are being brought up by millennials. That generation is an abject failure. Again, unless they follow those two rules before, do not listen to them. Troy, where can people find you? Aside uh, from the fact it's right there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> realtroyfrancis.com. Uh, come to my YouTube channel. Just type in Troy Francis. You'll find my YouTube channel. If you want to get advice on your dating life, if you want to do some coaching, if you want to um, you know, just chat to me about how things are going and how you can improve in the dating marketplace, uh, drop me an email, Troy at realtroyfrancis.com, and we'll organize a free uh, consultation call. I would also strongly recommend everyone read your book, How to Become an Asshole. You know, you don't promote that enough. That is a great um, hero's journey where you come from. You are you are a freaking loser. You are a wreck. <laughs> and you, like, no, it, Thank it's a night you. and day, day. You guys have really got to hear the story of Troy Francis, so please pick that up. Fitch, what's going on? Where do people find you? Go to johnfish.net, sign up for the newsletter. Um, you can book some consultations through the website. Also, uh, fitness, the girls, how to get the girls. How do we get the uh, Jesus Christ haircut? Where do we go for that? Is there a bar? Grow room? your hair, my friends. Yeah, boy. It's the super to lunch. Eat, eat meat and eggs. Lots of it. <laughs> it's where our superpowers reside in our hair. I've started – uh, oh mixing up some some beef liver into my my ground ground turkey and ground uh beef also so yeah, mm. yeah, yummy mm. Rolo, do you do anything on the internet do you got anything Ugh. uh no i uh okay so i'll i've got a pr uh, tomorrow i'm not going to be live i will be doing a premiere i'm recording it today and then i'll premiere it tomorrow because i will be up in lake tahoe with justin waller for most of the week uh in tahoe and we will be doing video and probably if i can wrangle them into it we might do a live stream like a midweek live stream up there if I, i'll bring the laptop and we'll do it but uh we'll be doing some uh certainly some instagram stuff uh look for pictures look for videos look for stuff that's going on tom's going to be up there too so we got a, a tech guy with us as well so we're just going to go there have a good time hang out be dudes and uh we'll probably end up doing a few a few videos while we're up there because we that's just us um is and then tahoe becoming the second miami like is everyone flying out there now no what to tahoe yeah like well, jason Hartman like was there and yeah. waller yeah that's i'm sure you here. would yeah oh yeah. miguel actually miguel from cultivate crypto might come up from vegas too like or like yeah, midweek you know. next week too so that's actually an added bonus uh, so I got that happening. Uh, I will be, let's see, I'll be in Vegas. Um, 
I'll be in Vegas on probably the following week after that. And then I'm going back to Connecticut because I'm in the process of shooting the video for my uh, players workshop. Uh, I'm going to do a class of, of sorts. It's going to be more like a master class kind of series of videos. And I want it to be like, this is the only time I've done anything like this. And I want to get it. I want it to be like top shelf polished and like look like a real video instead of shot from my laptop webcam. So I'll be doing, I'll be out in Connecticut with the Sables again, who are doing my video for videography for for this so that's coming up uh and then um i'm trying to think what else i've got uh oh if you're interested the trial of ascension ep will be dropping on august 29th and we will be doing a live stream from inside our rehearsal studio on september 3rd which is a saturday and we'll do a q a and if you guys have always wanted me to do some sort of like music program or music show or something that will be your wish is my command so that'll be on september 3rd which is a saturday probably about this time so cool all right. Well, uh, thanks for everyone for tuning in. I'm going to bang out some super chats. If you guys want to stick around, please do. But I always like to make sure I answer my super chats. Otherwise, if you guys got a bolt, uh, you could take off. But uh, Alex Patino for five bucks, shut up and take my money and like it. I will. Donna <laughs> Hannaford, just a buck from Australia. She's uh, she's my resident. She's my Torsha. Oh, boy. She's my Torsha, yeah. Mm -hmm. She's on the other side of the planet. I think we Sister wife. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. We're good. That's All it. All right. We'll see you guys later. The other one that was on there. So. All right. Toodles.